And our second reader tonight is Greg Helen Brownerville. Um, I'm going to just read this because I love the first sentence especially. He is a native of Pumpkin Bend, Arkansas. <laughs> that is a sentence I have never uttered aloud, and it's really great. I wish I could go. I want to go there sometime. I'll, I'll try to figure that out. They teach his creative writing uh, right now at Southern Methodist University. Uh, he has moved from this previously teaching at Lincoln University in Jefferson City. Uh, he has a, a couple of books, uh, Gust, which came from uh, Northwestern University Press, as well as this new one that he has with him tonight, uh, Deep Down in the Delta, which uh, are a series of folk tales that he has made into uh, prose poems and done with the uh, folk artist uh, Billy, oh gosh, I can't, Billy Wild, uh, Moore, sorry, I can't read my own handwriting, which is really lovely, ask my students. Um, but uh, he's got copies of that here tonight, it looks fantastic. He's going to read from that as well as from Gust. Uh, his poems have appeared in fabulous journals, including Oxford American, Prairie Schooler, Nature, among others. Uh, in 2007, he was chosen for the Porter Prize, uh, and is, is the youngest person ever to receive that award, which is awesome. Uh, and, uh, and, yeah. So deep down in the Delta is what he's going to read from tonight. We're so happy to have Graham Brown and Bill here tonight as well. Starlight dancing on his roach of hair, 
a mosquito flirting with the pink swirl of his ear. All at once he ran. I gave pursuit and wrangled him gangly to the grass near the edge of the woods. Are there any other suspects? I'm not at liberty to sing of such a matter. I will say that the suspect's ears were possessed of a strange, mollusk-like quality, like open clamshells with clams still in them. <laughs> I might even say that all human ears are unspeakably strange to me in this way. <laughs> sheriff, Sheriff, was the painting in Dobbs' car? Yes, ma'am, the masterpiece lay secure in the passenger seat. In the back seat, a white blanket was gathered in a cumulus bundle, <laughs> suggesting the cloud of hopelessness that hangs over many third world countries today. <laughs> Where is the painting now? The authorities here are holding the painting for now, even as we speak. It is at a safe, undisclosed location, being watched over by my deputy, Tommy Wampler. His mustache, like a soft brown fuzzy worm, sleeping on his lip. <laughs> uh, this next poem uh, is, is new. I've just written it, never read it uh, before to an audience, or to, yeah, even to an audience of one, such as a work friend in workshop or anything. This, this is brand new. It's called How He Knows. The singer is up late, humming and strumming in his dark studio. Across the room, the pocket of his bright blue poplin jacket goes luminescent. He puts his guitar down, fetches the phone. She's texting again. Go look outside, there's a me moon in the sky, all creamy like. He texts back, would it look the same up here? She replies, there's only one moon we human beings have to look at. Four years, long years, since the last time they touched. And she confessed the other evening, lately I've been putting you on speakerphone so my baby girl will learn her voice. He wonders if her husband knows about him, knows she calls and texts him all the time. The singer hides five states away, and yet nights like tonight, the gentlest hint of her waves, like the train of a wedding dress, rustles his feet. As he grabs his guitar, plucks it, whisper tipped, his humming suddenly has moonlight in it. Freak bout of 19th century emotion. He forces half a laugh. Lover's moons, at best, are mints and mothballs. Did they become fraudulent first in life or in song? No matter. The music swelling in him, then the dead Lord, will never be inflicted on the world. So be it. Still, he puts his jacket on and staggers into the chill night. He thinks about her little girl, a stranger getting to know him as a voice. That's all I am to anyone. He sips his jacket up. Translucent clouds are moving like calm surf. In the distance, Hills cliched with snow, the sky cliched with stars. He walks backward, then forward, side to side, as if drunk or dazed. A man desperately searching heaven for a moon. There is no moon. Heaven is a museum. The tweed old wishing stars have gone extinct, and nights like this are only simulated to show what love was like. That's how he knows they aren't alive and bioluminescent, swimming with his wet, astonished eyes. This next poem is called Welcome to the Old Cathedral. My name is Madison. I'll be your server tonight. I don't know where I am. Where am I? You're at the, I'm at a Tony restaurant off the square, crazy rain, trying to bring the stained glass to life, but you said you didn't know. I know about the restaurant and the rain, very urgent rain, but where am I? You are here. I want to be there. I'm more of a diner kind of a diner. 
When I was young, I frequented a diner on a movie set. The director had disappeared, and the actors had forgotten it wasn't real. I wondered if I wasn't one of them. The owner, Bill, had a weird dog that looked like Benjamin Franklin. Bill and the dog would come and greet me. Fish and chips and a cherry sprite, I'd say. Faith will be your waitress, Bill would tell me. She'll swing over in a minute to take your order. I'm Madison. I'll be taking care of you tonight. And there was a baby, a diminutive flaneur, wobble walking all about the set, making a voice noise like a straw fucking a milkshake lid. <laughs> I'm Madison. I'll be taking care of you tonight. Is it true what they say, Madison, that Michael McDonald and Garth Brooks are playing a secret concert just a few doors down and Elvis will split the eastern sky at sunrise? For our soup du jour, we have our invisible butterfly soul. That's going to come with seven Australian painted lady souls dissolved in hot holy water, water tinged with a suspicion of jasmine. It's not that McDonald has gone country, you see. Rather, Garth is doing blue-eyed soul. They're treating the audience to some universal evergreens like let's stay together and burning both ends of the night. For our special, shh, if you close your eyes, you can hear what a fool believes. Michael McDonald seen through his beard. For our special, we have our steamed heart of hummingbird. That's going to be served with a complex reduction of unrequited amusement and transubstantiated red wine. <laughs> Matt, you aren't listening. Let's go see. Let's go be. Roads, a gush with rivery rain, lady legs, a scamper on the square, frogs hopping like tiny sparks of apocalypse, Garth Brooks, it's all happening. Can I start you off with the 30th stanza of Keats's The Eve of St. Agnes, whispered by Lee Young Lee into a hearty flapjack scroll? <laughs> You're right, nothing's happening. Can I go home? You may go wherever you like. But do I want to go home to the elevator's deja vu, the mirror's dyslexia? When I reach to pluck gray hairs, the mirror turns my hand into a hopeless prize machine claw. You may go whenever you like. But where? Well, I want to go home if the king comes back and no one notices and the water won't turn to blood and the dead are busy getting their pH tested by the county extension agent. You may go wherever you like. If I do go home, what then? Hummingbird heart. Tell me, Matt, if I go home, will I sit there and smile stupidly like a Charlie Chaplin dog years after the ventriloquist has shelled him? Locked out of the cathedral in decades from my diner, I'll be a non sequitur without the Pringles. You may go whenever, wherever you like. Where did the shamans go, the strange men with their drums and dreams? I'll be taking care of you tonight. I miss that gal who took care of me at the diner. I miss her bathtub drain stopper necklace, silver beads, white plastic pendant. One time when Fields of Gold was playing, she looked up at the speakers and said, Oh, Sting, where is thy death? <laughs> I loved her low voice and worshipped the golden calf above each of her roller skates. I miss old Bill and Benjamin Franklin. I miss the wobbling baby, but the set has vanished into desert. Just as noun verb, so too other noun. I don't understand. Faith will be your righteous. I'd like to read one of the folk tales from deep down in the Delta about a fortune teller from my home county in Arkansas named Mamie Lackland. It's called A Slip of Paper. Two black girls went to Miss Mamie. She told one her future and wrote the others on a slip of paper. Told her not to open it until she got to her destination. The two girls left and headed wherever they was going. But they had a real bad wreck on the way. Car all crinkled up in the ditch. One girl was all right, but the one who had the slip of paper was dying fast. Before she gave up the ghost, though, she read that note Miss Manny wrote. It said, no future. This is called By Accident. 
In a crash the other day, no one hurt. It happened on Raspberry Lane near the new Clyde Cemetery. If Belle and I were still together, she might have been in the passenger seat when it was summarily obliterated. The world has vicious ways of making sense. My orange 76 Pinto shall never ride again. It's at a salvage yard on Highway 61. Homemade sign reads, We meet by accident. Sounds coyly spiritual, like angels playing cool. Maybe the salvage yard is also a magic church of soul repair. I once heard a preacher say, Jesus is a tow truck. He will tow your soul on the end. It's been all right getting along without a car. Luckily, on the corner, there's a soul food place with free Wi-Fi. Right now, I'm walking to the easy way to buy me some personal watermelons. I'm almost there. It's not yet light outside, but will be soon. The first time Belle stayed over, she said, Sometimes my arms and legs will go all over the bed. Sorry. Whenever I have wild dreams, I wake up in some weird other o'clock. Once, lying right beside me, she dreamed there were bears in her backyard. One crawling up her dress and cars driving around in the trees. I loved to hear her tell about her dreams. And I love the easy way. Love the walk there and back. Belle prefers the gym. When she works out on the elliptical, her ponytail looks like an American crow pecking at the back of her head. She's been known to wear a silvery black nail polish called Where Is My Limo and a turquoise kind called Lesbian Cruise. <laughs> this melodramatic furniture store I'm passing has been having a huge blowout clearance sale since 1980. Everything must go. It's a school day, and on my way back home, lugging my personal watermelons, I see the selfing students, hear the traffic, music, yelling. We've woken up in some weird other o'clock, and here we are. Work. Now we're somewhere else. <laughs> Loud is the new quiet, and I'm laughing right along, the laryngitic laughter of an old, cold engine, mad to gun again. Quiet is the new loud. I wonder how long I can stand it, and if I can say it. Does silence have addiction? I imagine the morning train from an aerial view, a magical unzipping across the land. What hands? What invisible hands? The darkness parts to offer up the nakedness of morning. What hands undress the night? I see the riders and the fighters, the hoopsters and the hipsters, the thrifters and the drifters, the loners and the goners. I'm missing Belle so much, and it matters so much. This glorious naked morning, soon we'll all be dead. This one is called Sweet Tooth Homeless. You've been gone a bad long while. I had stopped tipsy texting you all together. Had burned the bizarre home movies, even my favorite, the Christmas one. Remember? You were sitting on your sea green tailgate, arm around a my buddy dog. I was womaning the camera, as you put it. You warned your buddy not to let the man in red steal the holiday in his heart and made up a carol on the spot that went, Santa ain't nothing but Satan misspelled. <laughs> I tried to suppress my laughter, but there it was on tape, blooming winter sweet. You'd been gone a bad long while. It was closing time at the restaurant, one of those ferociously cold nights when the wind scrapes your face off. I was about to lock the front door when a filthy man hobbled up. I cracked the door. Excuse me, ma'am, he said. Can I ask you something? What? I used to come here with my wife, he said. Okay. Those display good desserts under the glass. They're real, aren't they? Why? What do y'all do with them at the end of the night? I stared at him. Long gray beard and hair. Big damp eyes. He looked like he was peeping through a brush pile. Wait for me in the alley, I said. It'll be a while. I shut the door. The last one out of the restaurant, I brought a molten lava cake and made him take his clothes off, lie down on the frozen asphalt, and open his mouth. 
Open wide like a baby bird, I said. You're only the second woman to see me naked since I've been grown, he confessed. Sickly ribcage like an old forgotten culvert. I dropped crumbs one by one. Some he caught in his mouth. Some got webbed in his beard. He closed his eyes to savor the flavor. I thought we were happy, he said. One day she told me my shadow was staying in her carpet. I dropped the cake and ground it into the muddy gravel with my bright black shoe. Lick it up, I said and left. The next night, I was expecting him. I didn't know what I wanted, to apologize, to degrade him again, to fuck him natural. At closing time, I peered down the empty street, swept bare by the shushing wind. An empty white sack danced along the sidewalk like a ghost, lost and getting used to it, merrily enough. The homeless man with a sweet tooth never came back for more. Well, here I am, writing you this letter, swearing it's the last. I'll uh, read two more poems, and uh, this one's called After a Sunday Morning Visit. It's a narrative poem with a somewhat complex plot, so uh, Y'all may be smarter than I am. I have trouble following such poems uh, when I'm hearing the poetry read because the, the reader doesn't give me a little summary at the beginning. But the speaker in the poem has moved away from home and he's come back uh, to visit for the, for the weekend. And when he's leaving, he realizes that he's he's still backing out rather awkwardly because his grandma's clothesline post, those cro you know, crosses, used to be there between the home that he grew up in, his parents' home, and her home, which were just across the yard from each other. And he realized that these posts aren't there anymore. The, the grandma has passed away some years before. The posts have been torn down. And he's still been awkwardly dodging them every time he's pulled, he's backed out. And he starts thinking about this, and, and thinks about his uncle, thinks about his grandma, has a bunch of memories from childhood, and then Returns at the end of the poem to that moment where he's uh, thinking about those cro close line crosses. My grandmother, too, mama, lived right there, a close line from my parents. I remember teas of cedar, taut wire, and swatting laundry. In trucks and cars, many thousands of times, I've backed out awkwardly to miss the posts. I guess I'd even done it since she died, and they were plucked from the earth, done it by force of habit until today, when suddenly it's ritual. Suddenly, it's this. As mosquito hawks hover above my car, two mama and her son, my uncle Vance, appear in the drive, ghosts, or tricks of memory. A simple scene, their easy grins, those rugged posts that stood for half a century on this mangy lawn. I remember coat top shooters, Crude weapons, me and Uncle Vance made out of clothespins, boards, and rubber bands. Mine was painted red. When mosquito hawks lit on the line, we'd launch our mini flying saucers, magical logos, and watch them zoom toward our prey. Vance, right beside me, like we were brothers, like he was still a child, and spring could last. To him, the clothesline must have seemed both curse and blessing. I was grown before two mama told me that as a kid he'd back up to a cedar post's dark wood and play like he was Christ. That was before he lost God and stopped singing. The crucifix came true as I dreamed his boy hands hanging. Back then, she said, he had good gospel lungs and sang so you could feel his soul and feel that latter rain. His fear about no sin shall enter into heaven woke a wailing lonesome in his songs. Listening, I tried to dream his voice to life and make it light up like a tavern's neon. She said you dumped old blue in a washtub over and over. I baptize you in the name of God the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost till the dog drowned. 
He buried blue and soft dirt beneath the glowing plums, dirt that kept arrowheads like secrets and knew the way from Coley's ribbon cane down to Gum Pond. Vance was eight. He crushed a dog's neck and felt the fight go out again and again in dreams. At eight, I ran nose first through sun-fresh linen, a blur of boys so new in the bright of the day I ran. The wind was time, and time the matador who never drew, for all was one bright present, nothing cost. When my uncle died, it was me strangling blue, blue in nightmares, Vance, a disembodied voice in my ear. I crossed the cross, going home to hell at 33 because I blasphemed Jesus Christ. In a recurring dream, I see him walk up to a giant tree. I smile and say, this oak gives the best shade, like an air-conditioned room. But he can't see or hear me as he lies down in the cool green light and whistles heaven's jubilee. His shirtless chest dries out and turns to soft white loam. When I kneel beside him, his red beard becomes an anthill, ants coming to a boil. I took the clothesline down three years ago, but spared a wooden tee. Spared it even though it blocked the drive and looked like it was going back to tree, lichens, and birds' nests. It survived on sun, arms wide to the weather. Survived patiently until I dug it out and burned it one still morning late last year. Didn't want to but I couldn't bear to see it fall on its own. I throw my arm around the passenger seat like we're bugs, look behind me, cut the angle just right. When dearest facts no longer live in muscle memory, this is what's left, deforcing it, relearning, returning. Soon I reckon I won't see the ghosts and the ghosts won't see me. We'll end this trouble, but soon's not here. Rough Cedar Cross, decrepit welcomer. I'm missing you this morning. Thank you all again for coming out and for having me. Uh, this will be my last poem. It's called Song for a Kiss. Something quick and wet on my neck. I whipped around and right behind me in the lunch line, Mary Arkansas Green, grinning shy mischief and maybe adoration. The girl who always stared at me during penmanship. Anger went all over me like fire ants, imagining a smear of mud on my nape as if she had stained me with her blackness. I reached back and tried to rub it off with my collar. I felt like blessing her out, but didn't speak a sound. Her grin was gone. I rubbed my neck again, but I could tell the kiss was there. Third grade year, Mary Arkansas moved to Little Rock, and I never saw her again. I sometimes thought of her kiss when the days dragged themselves like doomed soldiers through the Delta, towns dying, blacks and whites forever fighting, sweet Willie wine lashed to a light pole and stone, sheriff's home bombed, a young father mobbed and kicked to death at a track meet. One high school night, the races were set to rumble in downtown McCrory. The bloods were coming from Little Rock, the Klansmen from the Ozarks. This had to be settled, but nothing happened. I drove dead easy down the main drag at midnight, calm, deserted, the wind's nonchalance, the quiet was violence too. Anger from the rotting dead flew like homeless demons into the souls of aging blues men. The blues men understood, it's remembered, or else relive. Guitars were strung up, their song choked necks, ravaged by bottle glass and bone. On Friday and Saturday nights, white daughters sneaked behind the bank with black sons, and disheveled white fathers sat in their cars with handles of whiskey, shotguns pointed straight at plantation subdivision. No peace, no peace in quiet. And so I speak, 
confess, testify. One morning when I was 17, I heard about Mary Arkansas. The dark, exciting news like drugs from a diseased syringe coursed through the halls of tiny McCrory High. Remember Mary Arkansas Green? She got shot in the head last night in Little Rock. They say she might not make it through the day. I wanted to drive to Little Rock, find the hospital, find her room. I'll walk in slow and touch her hand. I'll lean down and kiss her. At once I felt ashamed for dreaming that my kiss, belated blessing, would be worth a good goddamn. That it could heal, heal anything, her, me, home. But Mary Arkansas's kiss, soft and urgent on my neck, sweet opposite of rope, it never left me, and I think it never will. Thank you.